Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Lowdown. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Michelle Mommertz, Academy Director of El Wassel. Michelle, a big welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you much. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Michelle, as we begin with every guest that comes on the show, we ask them to please take us through their earliest football memory. Oh my goodness. The earliest football memory uh, is when I was eight years. Um, I started at the, at the club where I later played professionally and my father was the coach and uh, I, I really do remember that vividly because I, he brought me there on the on, 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 he was on his bike and on, I, I sat on the back and it was about 15 20 minutes from from our uh, house and, and and he brought me to the field and that's he said uh, there you go uh, take a ball and play football that's what it that's what it was those days and you said like earliest football memory there at eight years of age it wasn't too long only seven years later 15. Am I led to believe that you became at the time the youngest professional footballer in the Netherlands? Yeah, that's correct. And and actually, I still am. Uh, however, I'm still the youngest professional. There are now, I think, two more persons who were amateurs, and they were some that played somewhere in the 1950s. Um, uh, yeah, I was actually very very young, uh, 15 years and 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 some days that I got um, the so called refrigerator contract. I don't know whether you ever heard of it, but in Holland, they invented a kind of uh, a contract for young, talented players who were younger than 16, because you were not allowed to sign a contract if you were younger than 16 years of age. And apparently I was quite, uh, quite talented. So the manager of the club said, you know what? We don't want to lose you because there was some other two or three clubs around in our area, professional clubs who were interested as well. So he said, you know what? We'll sign the contract now when you're 15. We put it in the fridge, in the freezer. And when you're 16, we take it out. And it's then, you know, legal. Uh, so my father had to sign and I had to sign. And that's what we did. So um, that's how the, the term of, of uh, refrigerator contract came about in Holland in those days. Yeah. And I mean, upon reflection, you've spent the vast proportion of your footballing career coaching, Michelle. I mean... Reflecting back at yourself as a 15-year-old, what made you stand out in your eyes as a coach looking all those years back? I mean, why at 15 were you so young to get into the game? Well, uh, I, I played professionally for 12 years. Um, and then I got an injury on my on my ankle and I was forced to stop playing uh, playing football. And I was at that time, I was 26 Um uh, on 26, 27, and uh, then I had actually no choice. Um, it, it, it's a bit of a, yeah, I don't know the right word, but it's a bit of a story because, you know, in my days, football was everything. Uh, my father said to me, you know, you're talented, don't need to go to school, uh, just, you know, put everything into becoming a football player. And so I did. So I didn't study. Uh, and in my days, the money was not that great. So uh, when I got that injury, obviously I had nothing. I had no trade, uh, didn't save money. Uh, I was married, had uh, uh, one, one son. And suddenly you have nothing. So then I was actually very lucky. Then I got approached by a friend of my father's who played with him in the same team. And he was a very famous coach in Holland. He was the coach of Feyenoord Rotterdam. Won the European Cup in 1974, lived in the same village. And uh, he visited us one day and said, uh, you know what, says, you still can kick a ball, right? Even though you have your injury and this and the other. I said, yeah, I, 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 I can. So, okay, you know, I'll give you a couple of months. I'll give you some exercises. I'll give you some skills if you can do that. And you can show it to me and prove to me that you still can do what I want you to do. You become my assistant. Will Corvo. Um, he was at that time developing actually the first one in the whole wide world, a grassroots uh, skill program, youth development program. And so he said to me after a couple of months when I proved to him that I still could handle the ball, he said, okay, you become my assistant and we're going to develop a method that goes all over the world. And that's what I did. So as of the years of, as of 27, I started coaching with youth, young, young, young uh, players from the age of eight to, to 14 in those days. 
And um, I did this, you know, and I'm now 62. So I, I, I did this for um, 35 years. In that part of the game, you fell in love with coaching grassroots and you spoke about there specifically the 8 to 14 years age bracket. Why so? Why that age group? Uh, I started out with 8 to 14 because that was a, a, a group of talented boys we had at our uh, disposal in Holland. Later on, it, 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 it became 5 to, to, to 14, 15, 16 sometimes. But why that group? Because that is the most... Uh, in my opinion, the most important age and the nicest age to work with, to teach children, to work with children, because at that age they are still, you know, children, and it's very rewarding, especially if you, you know, the way we work with uh, with those kids, and 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 therefore I always stood by it. I, I never had a thought of becoming a first team coach, even though I have the licenses and all that stuff. It's 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 so rewarding if you do it the right way. That uh, that I always stuck to it. And you speak about it there, the right way. For you, how would yeah. you describe the right way? Well, how long do we have? <laughs> On and off. <laughs> no. Well, yeah, the right way. You know, um, there's a lot to do and a lot to say about grassroots development, youth development, and, and many people write about it and, 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 and so on and so on. The right way is that you let kids of a very young age express themselves and be positive towards them. Many people, many coaches think they are way above the player. You're not. You're actually not so important. And it sounds silly, but that's the way it is. If you let a young guy express himself, let him show you what he is, where he's made of, what he can do, the only thing you need to do is hand him the tools, advise him, give him op options of what he can do or should do better, and be positive. And let him be creative, because that's every single individual has creativity. But the most coaches, the majority of coaches, they only think, okay, we need to win the game. We need to have results, regardless of everything. And that's definitely the wrong way. And they won't have results and they won't develop players. So among those uh, subjects I just mentioned, there are a few others who are very important. But the most important thing is that as a coach, especially in youth development, you gain the respect of the young boy or girl. And you don't do that by shouting and screaming and, 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 and wanting results. No, you get respect by showing them how things need to be done. Discuss them in, with them in a positive way. Explain in a positive way because the philosophy is you don't make mistakes. In youth development, players do not make mistakes. It's not a mistake if they do something wrong. Yes, it might be wrong or it is wrong, but it's not a mistake because you need to try and find out how it should be done and being told how it should be done. And then they will do it the right way. So don't say you make a mistake here and you're not good enough. That doesn't work. So that's, the, it's not a secret, but it's, it's, it's a way that many coaches can't live with because they think they need to win the game and they're so important. Trust me, you're not. And that's, that's the way to work with, 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 with kids up to that age. Naturally, a big part of this was the Cover method, and you worked alongside Vale Cover for twenty plus years. You even co-created a lot of the exercises that are still being used. Um, for those that are unaware, Michelle, how would you describe the Cover method? The Cover method is uh fantastic. Uh, it started out in in earlier days as a kind of demonstration model, you know, where we had a lot of skills. And we worked only with talented boys and we made them better. And um, the way the exercise work is that you not train one single element of football. You always train multiple elements of football. To give an example, you don't, you don't do only skills. You do skills, you do, you do uh, communication, you change direction, you think for yourself, you think for others. 
you know, all those kind of elements are all in the in drills or exercises in the Kufu methodology. And it's not just single minded practice. And the, I think the Kufu method, the way it, it was, and I say the way it was because uh, very unfortunately, uh, uh, the guy died uh, uh, six or seven years ago. Uh, we developed this further. And now it's the multiple practice of topics, of football topics that makes you more versatile, more unpredictable as a football player. But if I need to say one thing about the Kovo method, the guy, uh, Will Kovo, was a phenomenal. He was, he was, uh, we say he was the Einstein of football in those days. And I mean, having done this podcast for quite a while, two plus years now, what I'm starting to realize is that along any successful coach or any successful executive's journey in football, they would have come across quite a mentor. And for you, Viel, he really is that type of guy. You worked alongside him for 20 plus years. He even lived alongside him for 15 of those inside Dubai. That's correct. He was he was at times my father, believe it or not. Um, we had such a good relationship because he, he saw my commitment he saw my drive to learn because it was very difficult to learn from him. He was not the type of guy who said, okay, you know what, Michael, uh, Michelle, whatever you want to call it, uh, you look, this is the way you do it, this is the way you do it. He, no. He just gave you exercises and he said, okay, now you go and do it. And then he did different exercises. You just had to remember them. And after practice, you got home, wrote on, uh, on paper, you tried to remember because they were very some of them were very difficult and he taught me how to be creative because as a football player i was a defender i was totally not creative but he made me being creative by showing me how how you do this how you make the exercises how you talk to uh, to the players you know how you um mold you know the the skills into certain individuals because not not all the skills are good for every individual you know you give them 10 skills and if they know one or two or they can use one or two that's perfect so he was my mentor and i, I lived with him in the same house for for about uh, eight years and um yeah the, 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 the i can only say he, he was in that, those days my lifesaver and i i uh, um I owe everything to him, yeah. And you know what? I'm, I'm particularly intrigued to learn a bit more about Michelle is why did he have such a profound impact worldwide? I mean, we spoke, or you just spoke there about the impact he had on you as individually as a person. But how and why did he impact so many coaches worldwide? Because in those, in the days, in the, it started actually in the mid and 90s that you know, the methodology came more known worldwide and he, we traveled to all the associations worldwide. And at that time, youth development was actually sort of non-existent. You had a talent or not. You know, you had, uh, as I said, as a talented player, they drafted you, you came in the club. And uh, the only thing they did in those days was, you know, physically, uh, but tactically, they taught you a bit, conditionally, uh, that kind of stuff, but really nobody had the idea of that, hey, wait, I can make somebody better in in, in, in the skills level, because in those days everybody thought that's what you got, and that's it. And the, the, the philosophy came about, because when he was coached, before he became coached from Feyenoord Rotterdam, he was coached from Sparta Rotterdam. So two clubs in the city of Rotterdam, Sparta was the poor kind of club, let's say. Final Rotterdam was the more richer club. Consequently, all the battle players were playing in final because they had more money. They could buy the battle players, they get the battle players and so on. And he was stuck with Sparta Rotterdam with the hardworking guys, but technically not well equipped. So he then thought, hey, wait a minute. If I don't have the money, why don't I copy the skills of all the best players in the world, 
teach them to my players because they work hard, they have the mentality. I just need to teach them. And that's what he started doing. So he started teaching his players the skills of the great players in those days, like Pele, like uh, Rivellino, like uh, uh, Dida, and, 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 and then later on, uh, uh, Cruyff, and you name them, Beckenbauer, you know, in those days. And then he saw the success of it. Consequently, Fino took him on. Then he had success with Fino, and then obviously he got a heart, uh, heart problem, he had a heart attack, and he had to stop. And then he developed on this philosophy, the methodology, and saying, I can make every single player better in football. I don't make football players, but I can make them better and enjoy football more. That's the philosophy. Particularly interesting what you spoke about a few sentences back. You touched upon creativity, Michelle. Me, creativity seems to be a dying breed amongst coaches today and I know the, the last conversation we had over a cup of coffee back in September in Dubai was that about style and how I'm trying to link the two together is that obviously at the top, top echelons of football, your top 0.1%, you have your Guardiola's, your Klops, your Van Hals, who is another mentor of you. I mean, yeah. I'm very curious to hear more about what you have to say about style because for me, it seems to be a key substantiator in separating the best coach from others. Uh, yeah, that's true. Style, obviously, is it's it's a very big word because we had we see, we seen different eras of of style. You know, we had we started with the with the King and Rush, then we had uh, total football, then we had the Dicky Tucky, and now we see the 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 pressing and, and and the position games and you name it all. But the most important thing is that you only can play a style according to the players you have. Right now, we see that we let's put it that way. The tiki taki when Spain became, became world champion was the best football, but it killed creativity. It it was a kind of creativity. But now, if you see now, where's the creativity? Now it's a complete like a chess game, you know, great players, but the creativity on the pitch is far fetched. Now look look to the to the Champions League final. Where was the creativity? We have only what? You have Messi, you have Ronaldo, you have Mbappe, you have Neymar. And all the other players who try to be creative, most of them are stopped because that doesn't fit in their style of playing. So yes, the creativity is killed. After the World Cup, when the, 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 the technical department where Arsene Wenger is in charge of, brought uh, 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 their report to light, they they analyzed and they said the creativity is gone only certain players are still allowed to do something the rest has to be either passing moving or or or, or you know be in a position where the style of play sort of kind of thing you have to be so i entirely agree with you the creativity is 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 far 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 fetched at the moment and do you see that changing no, no, because uh, the success that been made, like Manchester City, with their way of playing, that goes all over the world. Everybody wants to copy the best teams and the, the teams that have the best results. The only way this can change is that when coach is going to realize that if you don't have a Messi, if you don't have an Mbappe, or you don't have a Neymar, what are you going to do? You need creativity in your team. You need to have technically very skillful players in your team. And then you can adjust your style of play to that. But you name 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 them. I just mentioned four of them. Okay, there's one or two here and there, but that's about it. Yeah, I mean, I had a similar enough conversation not pertaining to football, with Kirk Vallis of Google a few weeks ago, and we spoke about creativity, and he mentioned it as being the combination of two separate distinct ideas. So obviously, looking at this from the lens of a football coach, I mean, if we're to say it's a process of learning and discovery, should one seek to enhance their creativity, Michelle, by working alongside better people, 
by changing up environments. I mean, for you as a grassroots coach, and I know we'll touch upon Al Wasol now in a little bit, but for you as a grassroots coach traveling all over the world with Real Cover, was it that novelty, I suppose, of traveling from environments to environments where you're like, I have to be a little bit creative here due to the number of players at my disposal, due to the coaching styles, due to not being able to teach in Dutch, due to not being able to teach in English. I mean, how can coaches enhance their creativity in modern times? Ooh, that's a very, very good question and a very difficult question. Um, I think creativity is paramount because football is very boring if there's no creativity. And when you travel all over the world, if, if you go, for instance, go to, to, to South America, take Brazil, take Argentina. If you go to the beaches, the first thing you see is creativity, right? Those countries, they are still have very creative players. Travel to Europe, what do you see? It's all based on, 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 on tactics, on, on, as you say, the certain kind of style of play, whatever players you have to do that. So creativity is paramount, paramount, sorry. But because if, if, you don't, if you don't have that in your team, you're forced to just play a boring game. It's either you, you, you have a defensive game or you're just there to uh, interrupt the other team's game uh, and, and and you don't have any it's it's like you have no personality creativity gives you personality all the great players in the world creative players in the world they are personalities they say okay I take the ball and I, and I do whatever I like because I am a creative person not many coaches really like that kind of, of players they all want them to be in a certain system, in a certain style of play, like you say. So when we were traveling all over the world, when we then showed that creativity can be made functional, see, there's a, a, a great difference between creativity and functional creativity. I can be creative by going uh, five times forward and, and, and four times backwards, and I still do skills and moves and, and be creative, but it's about functional, functional creativity. Meaning that what I do, the skills I use, the movements I make, have to be functional. And that's what we're trying to tell them. I can have, I can give a player 20 skills to beat his opponent, for instance. And if he takes one of it and or two and 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 and, and demonstrate that's to hundred percent, performs into hundred percent, you are a winner. But it's functional. I, I don't have anything about creativity and going backwards, forwards, and it has no meaning. Like, uh, for instance, when Holland played the the the, the final, and it was only passing, passing, uh, uh, ten times uh, back, nine times forward. There is a complete difference in in the way you use creativity, and that's what we were trying to to deliver. Was there anywhere in particular that you traveled alongside Cover worldwide where you were like, "Wow, this is like something I've never seen before." in terms of creative session designs or in terms of the returns coaches were getting out of players? Uh, no. Funny. Funny enough, no. The, the, wherever, wherever we went, we were we were welcomed. And the people, after we'd done what we did, they said, oh, Jesus, this is fantastic. So, uh, no, no. And do you see this being changed in the future? Yeah, 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 it has to change. It will, it will change because now when you see that, I give an example, Germany, you know, when Germany uh, was kicked out of the World Cup, uh, not the last one, the one before, or the, 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 uh, about 10 years ago, I think it was, then the football in Germany is completely done. And the next story is about Belgium, who did the same. So what did the Germans do? The Germans, they went to Holland, they looked what they did, they went to, to the French, to the Spanish, and every, every positive and good practice from those countries, they took on and put into their development. And the result was, after I think four or five years, they were on top of the world again. Belgians did the same. They were nowhere. And suddenly they started, because I know the guy who was in charge of it, Suddenly, he started talking to, to the people in Holland. He started talking to us about the cover stuff. They implied everything. They implied the tiki-taki. They implied the cover stuff. And uh, they had great 
personalities as players uh, with the new name, De Bruyne, Hazard, and suddenly they were on top of the world. So this is going to happen again. People need to go back to the creative, skillful players. It's Football is entertainment, right? Mm. So if you can't entertain the spectators, what do you got? You see the Champions League final between Man City and AC Milan. It was, if you really analyze it, a very boring game. Right? But it is a Champions League final. But if you really analyze what you've seen, that wasn't much. So it's it's just about what you what how, how you want to interpret it. You know, and you can be effective and creative. And that's what we need to get to. Yeah, and then speaking of entertainment, I suppose you're situated currently in the entertainment capital of the world in Dubai. Quite a love yeah. story between you and El Wassel. You're currently Academy Director there at the club. And I know you and El Wassel, you've links going back 20, 30 years. How and all where did that journey begin? Uh, the journey started in 1987 when we came to Al Wassel, Culver and I. Uh, and there was actually well, infrastructure uh, and, 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 and you name it, almost nothing. You know, the, I think most of the people know Dubai the way it is now, but when, when we came, there was nothing. It was one, one, one building and, and that's it. But in football-wise, there was hardly any youth development. Um, so when we were brought in to actually bring in the youth development. And, and, and we started this in Dubai, and within three, four years, all the clubs in the UAE copied it. So we actually were on, on, the, on the grassroots of, of youth development. And the football then, and now there's a huge difference. Obviously, the game evolves and the game becomes different and you know the area becomes smaller, it gets faster, and so on and so on. But I dare to say that the football in those days was better. It was nicer to watch, you know, um, especially here in this country. Um, the mentality of the players was a lot different. If we are talking Dubai, in, in, in those days, you know, the players, they, they really wanted to become a football player. You know, they, 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 they did everything for it. And there were semi-pros, you know, there were some, and we practiced sometimes even in the sand. We didn't have grass. Um, that came years later. So there was there was a big, big, big difference in, in when we came and, and the way it uh, it develops. But I prefer the older days, to be honest. And, I mean, is, is it a fair thing to say that it's an increase in the accumulation of resources for a lot of those players outside in Dubai that the hunger to turn pro has kind of quenched? Uh, yeah, that's that's one that's one of the of the reasons that you know um, the resources they have other things to do you know financially most of them are are quite sound so it's not a way of survival and 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 and, and all over the world mostly all over the world football is a way of survival a way out of poverty you know mm. in, in in most countries and 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 you would do everything for it you would you would you know that's your life. Uh, here it's not. Here it's it's kind of a hobby kind of thing. Um, not being disrespectful, but um, you see how many people uh, players from from the Middle East play in 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 Europe or, or or name it anywhere else. Not one. Okay, one or two from Egypt, uh, Mo Salah, and, and 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 that's about it. But if we really talking Middle East. Hardly anyone. So yes, it's the resources, different way of life, technology, you name it, you know. And 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 I think a uh, way technology is is killing uh, um, a part of development in the game, uh, especially here. Uh, they rely a lot on it. Um, so that's uh, that's the main part, I would say. Interesting because you see the influx of top class players you would say to Saudi Arabia at the moment just across the Gulf and obviously there's been there's been players that have been making a move across to Dubai too in the UAE so it's interesting to see if they'll ever follow in Saudi's footsteps and attracting a bigger name across to the league do you see the future of youth development evolving in Dubai or for the reasons above do you see 
there being a stop? No. No, I don't think so. And I think, you know, there have been precedent in, 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 in like you mentioned, Saudi. Uh, now the big stars go there and, you know, they're all at the end of their career. And there is a nice example, you know, in China. China did the same thing, you know, whatever, five, ten years ago. They wanted to promote football and they brought all the big stars and they had a load of money was paid. And what happened? It was a great PR stunt, but the football didn't develop. Look where China is now. If Saudi is not going to concentrate on youth development, then bringing in the big shots, the big stars, is nice. It's PR for the country. Uh, it 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 uh, it markets the football, but it has totally no influence on the development of the game because those big stars they play one or two years. And all of them who are going there are at the end of their career. And it's a, it's a classic example. Any country who wants to, you know, do this kind of things, they do it mainly firstly to as a PR, as a marketing reason, but not for development, because development is grassroots. That's where you need to spend your money. And if you yeah. do both at the same time, yes, that would be great. But that's mostly not the case. The same way we spoke about creativity, though, earlier on, I mean, don't you think it's a terrific opportunity for coaches and youth developers over there in the game to get creative in terms of how do you have players that are from, listen, have an abundance of riches and abundance of resources? How can you create pro footballers out of them? Because to the best of my knowledge, something like that's never been done before. No, that's correct. So that would be a, uh, that would be great. That would be a big challenge, but I, I think it's possible. I think it's really possible because the the... By bringing in this, those, those stars, obviously football is now more alive. You know, it 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 it's it's in their it's in their economy. It's 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 in everybody's life, daily life. Um, so yes, I think if you had clever people who would focus and use this in development of their local players, and by development. The most, the, one of the most important things, as I just mentioned or before mentioned in the beginning, is to create a personality. You need to create personalities who can say, listen, I want to play football. I'm going to play football. I want to play football. You know, and those personalities you can develop with the right methodology, with the right coaches. And if you have on top of this, those big stars playing with you where you have an example. I want to be like that because that's what you need to use them for. You want to be like them, even though you know you never will be, but you want to be. You want to strive to become. And that's where you need to, to head to. You want to strive to become a big star. And uh, yeah, well, that would be great if they could or would uh, concentrate on, on that. And the other question, I don't think in the UAE, they will ever go that far in making those kinds of investments to get those big players here. There's been talk about Ibrimovic, um, but I think he declined twice. So I, I don't think that will happen here. Okay. And I mean, overall, I've really enjoyed this conversation, Michelle. It's been great to get a glimpse into your own career, the cover method and current work at Alwa. So, but before we wrap up, I mean, for those that are wishing to thread a similar path or that's slightly bit inspired by listening to you speak about your career story to death, what advice would you have for them? Well, what advice would I have? Um, just to be dedicated in what you do. And if you are in youth development, you know, don't think you are more important than the player. You are there to help, gain respect by helping them, giving them the options, showing them the right way. But be dedicated in what you do. And again, result is not important. That's the most important thing. Result, the game result is not important. Development, progress of a player is the most important thing. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Michelle. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.